Greetings and welcome to another lecture in introductory psychology. This lecture is on glia, also known as glial cells, which are basically the unsung heroes of the nervous system, specifically the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, because they make your brain and spinal cord work better, but they get none of the glory, they get none of the fame, except of course when things go wrong and then they get all of the blame. Welcome to support staff. So, glia cells, it's a, I mean, when I say support staff, I mean that literally. They not only provide support in terms of things like housekeeping, where glia will clean up after other cells, cells that have died or been injured or, or whatever, but they will also provide support in the literal sense, in that glia, it looks a little bit like glue, the word glia, glue, and in fact glia in many ways are the glue that holds together the brain. And they can literally do this. Some glia, for instance, have pseudopods. They have what looks like limbs sticking out from them. And they will hold on to other brain cells with those limbs. It's almost like a framework so that it is glia that literally and figuratively holds the nervous system together. They're also involved in food delivery. They help keep everything functioning. Okay, they are the butlers and the waiters and waitresses and the housekeepers and everything else that help keep people's lives going and very easy so that the other brain cells and the neurons can focus on what it is they need to do. Glia also produces a substance called myelin. Now, if you've already looked at the structure of the neuron or you've looked at the action potential, you know what myelin is, what myelin does. If you haven't, then just think of it as an insulator. The signals that are sent through brain cells are called electrochemical signals. They involve both chemical ions and electrical charges. And myelin essentially is the insulation that keeps the charges going and not from just sparking out and stopping the signal right there dead in its tracks. Because often what happens when those glia are holding on to those those brain cells and they wrap their you know their their arms around those cells or grasp onto them that's the myelin part. So it not only holds it together, but it insulates it. Now there's a number of different types of glia. I'm just going to mention two, because these are two that we tend to hear about. They are two that tend to cause trouble on occasion, or in fact allow things to work very, very well. The first are called astrocytes. Now astro comes from the same base word essentially that we get the term astronomy. So astro means star. And at sight means body, essentially. So what we have are literally star bodies, and that indeed is what they look like. They look a lot like what I grew up calling starfish, but are actually technically called sea stars. They have all these arms sticking out from them, the way that starfish, the sea stars do. And they use those arms to not only hold on to things, but they can also use those, those limbs to move. Astrocytes are only found in the central nervous system. They're only found in the brain and spinal cord. Actually, glia are found everywhere. If I made it appear that they're only found in the central nervous system, I was incorrect. Glia are found everywhere. But astrocytes are only found in the central nervous system. And astrocytes can indeed move from place to place. They use those limbs to almost like crawl or slither. Or the image I have that is completely incorrect is they sort of swing from limb to limb like Tarzan. But they can actually move through the brain to get to where they need to be. Now, astrocytes don't get a lot of attention except on occasion when they go wrong. Cancer, as you probably know, is, where, uh, is when cells in the body start to divide out of control. And the thing is, as you may have heard, which is kind of right, brain cells don't tend to divide. There are some brain cells that do divide, but not like the rest of the body does, and you're constantly. So if brain cells don't really divide, the question is, then where do brain tumors come from? And the answer is, they come from glia. Glias divide all the time. And in fact, one of the more common types of brain tumor is called an astrocytoma, which is an astrocyte that has gone berserk. Now, as I've mentioned, astrocytes are found in the brain and spinal cord. Schwann cells are found everywhere except the brain and spinal cord. And this is one of the earlier examples of what I like to call 
well, it's another one of what I like to call Fassbender's Law of Science, which is if you want people to remember your name, discover something basic, and name it after yourself. I assume there was a Dr. Schwann way back when who discovered the Schwann cells. Now, Schwann cells, as I said, are found everywhere except the brain and spinal cord. And they do everything that astrocytes do. They can move, they do the housekeeping and the support and everything, but they do something else, something very interesting. Schwann cells allow nerves, allow neurons to regenerate, to regrow. You may have heard of someone who's had an appendage lopped off, finger, hand, you know, they, they've lost something. And if it, that, that uh, appendage is found and kept on ice so it doesn't deteriorate very often, doctors will try to reattach it. Or if you've heard of people these days, there are hand transplants and face transplants and even something like a, a kidney transplant, all of these things. The only reason that they work the way that they're supposed to eventually, more or less, is because of Schwann cells. Now, when things are reattached, now everything gets sewn together, of course, you know, uh, bone gets attached, blood vessels, muscles, tendons, ligaments, everything gets sewn together, and nerves do as well. And you often have to dig for those, by the way. Nerves are springy. When you cut them, they tend to go tring, and they tend to go back and where you got to root around and yank them out a little bit and tie it. Now, that nerve section is dead. It's been cut in half, okay? There's not a whole lot that it can do to repair itself. But what happens when a nerve dies in the peripheral nervous system is Schwann cells come from far and wide, and they line up along the path of that dead nerve in much the same way and for much the same reason that pigs line up at a trough or people line up at a buffet. It's dinner time. They actually get rid of those dead nerves by eating them. They phagocytize them. Okay, they eat them. And while they're lined up, these Schwann cells secrete some kind of chemical that allows the undamaged ends of the neuron to neurons to regrow through the path of the Schwann cells. The Schwann cells are like laying the path where that nerve was. So they regrow through those and actually reattach. So someone who has had a finger reattached may eventually get some sensation back in that finger. Okay? They may eventually be able to feel things with that finger. Now, they're not going to get all of it back because, quite simply, not all of the neurons are going to be able to be reattached. Surgeons can only work with what they see. And the only thing that can be seen, generally, are most of the larger neurons. So you get some back, that is good. It's also why it may take a while, for instance, to get sensation back into something that has been reattached, because it takes a while for those neurons to regrow. Now, if you think about it a second, this also explains why if you damage your brain or spinal cord, you don't get that healing, because there are no Schwann cells in the brain and spinal cord. Schwann cells are only found everywhere else. They're only found in the peripheral nervous system. And of course, the next obvious thing is, well, has someone actually tried to take essence of Schwann cell and use it to help treat brain or spinal cord injuries? And the answer to that is yes. I know of some research, uh, perhaps the most, th the one I remember best is where a group of rats had had their spinal cords deliberately severed so that they were paralyzed f essentially in their hind limbs. Now, some of these rats were treated with essence of Schwann cell and some of them were treated with something else. And the rats that were treated with the Schwann cell chemicals actually regained enough mobility in their hind legs again to be able to walk. Now, they didn't walk well, but they did indeed walk. Obviously, there had been some healing. Now, as you can imagine, there's a whole bunch of people with spinal cord injuries who are lining up as we speak, going, me next, me next, me next. The, there's going to be a couple of problems, though. First of all, at least at this point, this is only going to really work for spinal cord injuries. Because spinal cords, compared to brains, are relatively simple. We got, you know, axons going this way, we got axons going that way. They tend to go in nice paths. Brains, on the other hand, have neurons that are so tangled up that it would be almost impossible. You might be able to regrow the neuron, but you wouldn't necessarily be able to regrow the connection. So it may indeed be useful at this point for spinal cord injuries, but the spinal cord injuries are going to have to be new. This will not work where there has been healing. Because first of all, when the spinal cord has been damaged and it heals, you can wind up with some kind of scarring, and it's not going to regrow anything through a scar. But perhaps most importantly is, 
The nervous system is very expensive physiologically. It takes a lot of energy. If you've watched the section on uh, the action potential and neuron neuronal transmission, you know what I'm talking about here, okay? And so the body's not going to keep around something that isn't doing any good. It's not going to keep around a chunk of spinal cord that's not sending any signals. So those spinal cord neurons begin to deteriorate relatively quickly. It's why even if people paral are paralyzed, very often their doctors will exercise the limbs that aren't working and they'll hope to keep through reflexes some of these neuron pathways open. So I do suspect that in the future we are going to be able to treat spinal cord injuries. I used to say 15 to 20 years. Now I'm saying 5 to 10. That we, used to be, we may be able to treat spinal cord injuries so that the person can recover most, if not all, probably not all, of their lost functioning. But be very careful until then. Because if you get damaged before then, there's probably not going to be a whole lot of anything that can be done to fix it.